going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about the micro-universe within your body and on your body. Um, so this is the title, it's our microscopic universe, your microbiome and you. Or if I'm really honest, there's something that's going to feature in my talk a lot. It's also called the wonderful world of poo. <laughs> So let's just get that out there now. And you may see Mr. Hankey there. That's to remind me that you're all going to help me with a little experiment, OK? So what I would like you to no, it doesn't involve poo. <laughs> just get that clear now. What I'd like you to do is turn around to the person next to you, behind you, or in front of you, and shake their hand and say hi, or hello, or whatever you want to do. You can give them a kiss if you want. I don't mind. OK? Is everybody doing that? Brilliant. I will tell you why later. You will find out. OK. So we're going to be talking about the microbiome. And the microbiome, I think more than any other field in science, is subject to an awful lot of hype. So I pulled these headlines off the web. And they're taken from various newspapers and web articles. And it just shows you all the things that are being linked to your microbiome. It's helping medicine. It's making you sleep. It's not making you sleep. Um, it's, it's regulating your nerves. It's causing allergies. It's causing asthma. And the market in manipulating your microbiome is staggering, whether it be well-being sites that have unusual ways to manipulate your microbiome, or companies selling you expensive drugs or foods to change your microbiome. The market is absolutely huge. So what do I mean when I mean microbiome? What it means is the genetic content from the microbes that live in and on your body. So sometimes we talk about the microbiota. That's the actual organisms. And those organisms are very varied. We have yeast. We have viruses. We have fungi. Few parasites. But what we know most about at the moment is the bacteria. And that's not to say that the other things are not important. It's just that we don't know so much about them yet. And they are doing all sorts of incredible things in our body. They're helping us make vitamins we couldn't otherwise make. They're training our immune system. They're helping us digest our food. And the numbers are absolutely staggering. Each one of you has 38 trillion bacteria, approximately, living inside you and on you. That's quite a big number. Let's compare it to the population of the planet, shall we? Which is around 7.6 billion. So let's compare just one of your little communities with the population, the human population of the planet. Gone. You dwarf everybody on the planet. You're a little universe. And if you really want to have fun with the numbers, you can work out how many bacteria are on everybody in the planet, which I think is 2.9 times 10 to the 23. I think that was bigger than some of the numbers we were hearing from Kerry earlier. <laughs> so bacteria win. <laughs> Sorry, Kerry. Um, and the, as I say, they are doing absolutely incredible things. And they're really, really diverse. You have very different communities on different parts of your body. If we take your skin, we have three main types of landscape. So if you look at something like the backs of your arms, that's quite a dry, arid landscape. So very specific communities will live there. Then you have the oily parts of your face, for example. Specific bacteria really like the oil. And then you have your creases, your folds. You know those folds. And again, very specific bacteria live there. And they won't be the, diff they won't be the same on different sites of the body, so each crease will be different. 
And just to illustrate this, this is an art piece by an artist called Mel Fisher. And what she does is she creates agar sculptures of parts of her body. This is her face. And then she has seeded it with some of her own bacteria. And depending on the mix of agar she uses, or the type or where she's taken the bacteria from, she can get a very, very different sculpture. So that's a way of visualizing how different your bacteria are. And actually, there's some fungi on that one, too. And the reason that we're getting all this hype about these bacteria is because they are doing so many incredible things. They can give us superpowers. They can also <laughs> make us a little nicer to live with. So your large intestine is essentially a large fermenter making a huge amount of gas. And what the bacteria in your large intestine does is it reduces that gas. It uses that gas for food. So if it weren't for your gut bacteria, you would fart even more than you already do. <laughs> and the gut bacteria are flavoring your farts, <laughs> literally. So if you have sulfur-producing bacteria, you make eggy farts. <laughs> so who, who does those? Anybody here? <laughs> Shh. If you have methane producing farts, you can do exactly what this picture shows you. But please don't try that at home. Um, so it just shows you the power of these bacteria. So let's move on to the other superpowers, shall we? This is a desert rat. Now, the desert rat lives in the desert. And I know, aptly named. And as you can imagine, there is not very much food where it lives. And so one of the things that grows in abundance is the creosote bush. The creosote bush is poisonous. Anything that eats the creosote bush would, would die, but not the desert rat. It can eat the creosote bush really, really comfortably. And people wondered if this was something to do with the gut microbiome. So what they did is they gave these rats antibiotics. The, the rats then tried to eat the creosote bush, dead rat. You could then also transfer these bacterial communities into populations of lab rats that had never seen creosote bushes before. And suddenly they acquired the ability to eat. I don't know if they enjoyed it, but they could certainly eat creosote bush. So it shows you the power of those microbial communities. This is a picture of Danger Mouse. It's a cartoon that's kind of popular, or was popular in the UK. I think it came back. And Danger Mouse seeks danger. And this is, there's this interesting idea that the microbiome is helping our brain and vice versa. There's this research that suggests there's a whole gut-brain axis. And when it was first discovered, what they were doing is they were using germ-free mice. Now, germ-free mice are reared in kind of bubble environments. They have no microbes at all. And what the, the lab was doing is they were looking to see what certain types of probiotic could do to the, to the, to the mice. So they would in inoculate the mice with these probiotics, and then they would look at the behavior. And probiotics are sort of helpful, so-called helpful bacteria. Now, the, the mice that were given one particular strain of antibiotic suddenly got really nervous. And they do these tests where they have to look and see whether they want to get off a little stand. And they were really, really nervous. And this is one of the tests they weren't doing well on. And when they looked at the brain structure, they saw differences in the brain, which they attributed to these probiotics. So perhaps the probiotics and bacteria are signaling to the brain. And this is probably where all this research suggesting that it's having impacts on things like anxiety and depression is coming from. Obesity is another area where the microbiome has been implicated. So 
obviously you can see which mouse is fat. <laughs> I don't need to point it out to you. So what they did is they took germ-free mice again, but these were germ-free mice that were genetically programmed to get fat. So they're kind of on a pathway to, to plumpness. And then they inoculated them and control mice with human bacteria from either lean volunteers or obese volunteers. And suddenly, the fat mice, or the mice that should get fat, didn't get fat. They stayed thin. And the lean mice that had the obese microbiome ballooned up. So, could the microbiome be key for our weight? Who knows? So how do we acquire a microbiome if it's doing all these incredible things? The, the way that we acquire it, so there's some studies that suggest it actually could be in utero, it could be inside us, but by and large, the majority of the evidence is really about the process of birth. So how you're born helps set up your microbiome. If you're born by a cesarean route, you will acquire a lot more skin bacteria as part of your natural microbiome. If you are born by the natural route, then you are more likely to acquire a mixture of vaginal and fecal bacteria as part of your microbiome. The next thing that will affect it is the route of feeding that you give your baby. Breastfeeding can transfer microbes from the mother to the baby, and the oligosaccharides, the sugars that are present in milk and breast milk, enhance the growth of particular strains of bacteria. And that will be quite different if you're bottle-fed. So these are some of the very early things that will set up your microbiome. Thereafter, it's really about diet. Diet is the biggest thing that shapes your microbiome, which kind of makes sense when the bulk of your microbiome is sitting inside your gut and it's dealing with the food that you eat. And that is really shaping the constituencies that you have. So if you eat a very high-fat diet, with this, actually, it's looking really tasty at the moment, this tasty burger, you will have one type of bacteria dominating. If you eat a very varied kind of high-fiber diet, you will have a very different group of bacteria dominating. And antibiotics. That is another factor that will shape it. And um, particularly if you're very young, the antibiotics will have more of a dramatic effect. And um, when you're older, your body's, your microbiome's a little bit more resilient. So it kind of changes, but it can re-establish itself after antibiotics. But it's all these sorts of cocktails of things that happen in your life that really shape and dictate your microbiome. So what can you do if you then want to change it. If you want to change it, so if you want to reduce your risk of obesity or allergy or whatever thing that's concerning you that you're worried your microbiome is doing. This is a picture of probiotics. It's a particular strain of lactobacilli, these friendly bacteria. And there's been a lot of interest in whether probiotics can really help change our microbiome. And I'll be honest with you, the studies are really mixed. Some studies suggest that, yes, they can have a very positive effect. They can help inflammation in the gut. Perhaps, you know, you can sometimes get some temporary inflammation after you take antibiotics. They may reduce that. They may help with irritable bowel syndrome. And they've even been used to, to help with inflammatory bowel disease. But the studies are still quite mixed. And part of the problem is that they may not be able to get to where they need to get. So the communities of bacteria that live nearest your cells in your body, that are need those impacts from the bacteria the most, those communities of bacteria are very resilient to being colonized by probiotics. So it will all depend on the context. In our lab, we have been using probiotics, but what we do is we kill the probiotics and we put them on your skin. 
So lots of us, as we get older, will develop wounds that do not heal in a timely fashion. And if those wounds become infected, they become a real risk of developing things like um, you sort of, they can go all the way down to your bone and you may need things like amputation. And so our lab's very interested in looking at the relationship of the communities of bacteria with the process of wound healing. So one of the things we've done is we've been investigating what these probiotic lysates, we call them, can do to the rate of skin healing, but also the communities of bacteria that could cause a problem. And some of these probiotic lysates are really good at stopping potentially pathogenic bacteria stick to your skin. Um, and they're also very good at helping the wound knit together. And some of them can even kill pathogenic bacteria. So there is some potential, but they're perhaps not the hype that they're getting. Sorry. So, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> no, it's not one of those. Trust me, it's not one of those. Other end. This is an enema kit. And this is probably one of the most extreme ways that you can change your microbiome. Beloved of celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow, who's a real fan, apparently. Um, so what you do is you essentially squirt lots of lots of liquid. You flush it through your bomb up through your large intestine. There's no elegant way to describe it. It's often coffee. I assume not hot. I don't know why it's coffee. I don't know if there's a difference. And what that essentially does is it's supposed to flush out lots of the stuff in your gut. Um, and that's supposed to cleanse you and get rid of all your toxins. But what, of course, it's actually doing is it's flushing out a lot of your microbes and it's potentially damaging those layers of microbes that are closest to the cell lining of your body. So it's potentially quite damaging. But you could take it a step forward and use another bit of kit. You know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> you so do. Um, <laughs> so, you know these, these people that have the properties that you admire, maybe they're really skinny, they have no allergies, they never get sick. You would ask them for a little donation. <laughs> Pop it in the top. <laughs> Make a poo smoothie. <laughs> or I guess you could call it a fecal microbial transplant, which is the scientific name for it. But it is a poo smoothie. <laughs> and there are a variety of ways that you can have your smoothie. <laughs> it can go that way, usually through a tube. I will say that. Uh, it can also go rectally. Uh, it can even be turned into little pills. Um, and you can swallow them. Um, and, you know, I think this is the number one reason why you should never, ever, ever buy a second-hand blender. <laughs> Check them out on eBay. <laughs> and there are self-help sites that tell you how to do this in the best ways. And I know it sounds awful, but there could actually be a genuine reason for doing this. And it's down to this fella here. This is Clostridium difficile. Now, Clostridium difficile is a bacteria that can be present in our gut normally. And it's not a problem if it is for most of us. But particularly in elderly people, particularly often if they've been in hospital for a while, it can really take over in the gut. And when it does, it causes something like this. This is a, a view of inside the gut. This is showing you gut inflammation. It causes incredibly severe diarrhea. And it, it, it can be fatal. I mean, it's horrible. It's really not nice. And it's really, really hard to treat with antibiotics. 
So it's an incredible problem for patients who have this. But if they get one of these, so this is your poo smoothie, this is what it looks like, and they're treated, they can restore the community of bacteria in their gut, and their gut will look like this. This is a healthy gut. Now, when this is done, it has to be done under clinical supervision. You have to screen the donors to make sure that they don't have any infections. And unfortunately, just yesterday, there was headlines um, in the States. Some patients received um, this, this procedure for C. diff infection, and they were unintentionally given a multi-drug resistant strain of bacteria that was fatal. So when I say don't do this for fun and don't follow the Reddit sites that tell you how to do this, I'm not joking. It is very, very dangerous. And they are again looking at this procedure because it's the best way to treat C. diff infection, but this was not a strain of bacteria that they had been routinely screening for. But it can work. Now, I've told you that changes in bacteria communities are linked with a whole host of diseases. So what we often see is we'll see a little bit less diversity, a little less kind of variance in the population. We'll often see certain types of bacteria more frequent. But particularly in human studies, it's all correlation. Doesn't mean it causes it. Um, so this is my diagram of correlation versus causation. Um, so I think this is a really nice example because, of course, the number of people who die by becoming tangled in their bed sheets completely correlates with per capita cheese consumption. <laughs> Therefore, the two are definitely causative. There's a whole website, so it's Tyler Vigan, so do look at the website. It's brilliant. You will learn so many great correlative facts that you can share with your friends. So I'm, I need to give that sense of caution to you that just because two things change doesn't mean they're causative. And there's another real problem with a lot of the studies, and it comes back to Mr. Pooh. Everything so far really in the literature focuses on fecal samples and analysis of microbes from feces. Because obviously, it's really easy to get, and we can find a lot of microbes in the feces. Now, we have enormous variation in the microbes that live in your large intestine, your small intestine, your stomach, your esophagus, your mouth. Is the feces representing that? And when you look at the hyperlocal level, you can see even more differences. So this is a microscope image on the left, taken from my lab. And what you can see is the blue dots are the nuclei of the cells that line your colon. There are the epithelial cells. And some of these epithelial cells make mucus, which is green, OK? So some of them have mucus in their cytoplasm and some of them are pushing the mucus out, and that mucus barrier is very important for your health. Good mucus barrier is really, really important. Then you see there's a strip of green over those epithelial cells, and that is a sort of thin but very viscous mucus layer that's very hard for bacteria and pathogens to get over. But then above that, you can see sort of green and red mess. Now, the red is microbes. That's some of your microbiome in the gut. And then what we've got next to it is a cartoon to show you that in cartoon version. So what you can see is you've got microbes that are living in the mucus very, very close to the cells of your body, the epithelial cells and the immune cells. And then you've got microbes that are found just outside the mucus. Is that fecal sample telling you about these microbes, these mucus resident microbes. And in terms of thinking about what matters for our health, what do you think matters more? 
the mucous microbes are much, much more close to your body cells. And it's something that we've looked at in our lab, and we've shown that the mucus resident bacteria are well different to the fecal resident bacteria. So they're not necessarily giving you a good indication of what's happening in your gut. And in terms of thinking about sensitivity for telling you what's happening in a disease state, we've looked in models of inflammatory bowel disease, and we see changes in the microbial communities in the mucus bacteria long before we see changes in fecal bacteria. So again, thinking again about those fecal microbial transplants, would we be putting in the right bacteria for all of these conditions if we only put in fecal bacteria? And another issue with all the data, don't worry, you're not expected to read this. This is what actual microbiome data looks like. This is one of four pages. And this is analyzing the skin bacteria that we are analyzing from my lab between two different states, healed and non-healed wounds. And what we do as biologists, we go, da, 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 top change, top change, top change. They matter. Uh -uh, that's not how gut bacteria work. That's not how skin bacteria work. Your bacteria and all the other things that are in your microbiome that we kind of forget about because we're not so good at analyzing them yet, they work as communities. They're cooperating with each other. They're sustaining each other. They're helping each other. So one bacteria missing from that community may not matter because there may be three other members that do the same job. So you have to think about function and whether it functionally matters and we're not quite there yet. And this is something that we've been thinking about in our lab and thinking about how can we analyze the data in a different way. So this is data where what we've tried to do is we've tried to arrange the bacteria in our gut by phylog phylogenetic tree. So how related are they? And what you can see here is we've color coded these. So all the pink stuff is bacteria from mucus and all the brown stuff, what's well, kind of orange here, is bacteria from stools, from feces, from poo. So even visually, you can see these are on very different places of this phylogenetic map. And if you're very, very close together on that map, you're more, you know, you're more closely related. If you're far down at one of those tips, you might be related to one of the roots, but you'll be nowhere near, say, so if you're one of the pink tips, you're nowhere near one of those brown tips. But this gives us a different way to start to ask questions about the communities of bacteria and say, OK, well, if these bacteria are changed, but, they're all in the, but we've got all these other ones that are still there on that same lineage, then maybe it won't matter. So should you want to change your gut bacteria, after I've just told you it's really impossible to do, what could you do? Well, studies have looked at people who live really healthy, long lives. You know, those people, they're just fantastic. They're out running up mountains when they're 90. And you're just like, wow, that's awesome. Versus people who are really frail and unwell and get lots and lots of things wrong with them. And what they've discovered is the biggest difference in the microbiome, and it is fecal, um, is that if you live these long, healthy lives, you have a very varied, diverse microbiome. If you're frail and unwell, you have a very lacking in diversity, much fewer types of members there in your microbiome. And that's also true of a lot of the diseases where we see changes in the microbiome. We see often lack of diversity is associated with a bad disease. So that suggests that diversity in those microbial communities is what's most important for your health. So what can you do if you want to have a diverse microbiome? And the simple answer is, do you remember what drove the biggest change in your microbiome as you were developing? It's your diet. If you eat a really varied diet, and microbes really like sort of these high fermenting foods, these fibrous foods, 
then you are much more likely to have a diverse community of microbes that can deal with all these foods. So that is my top tip to you if you want to have a nice, diverse microbiome. So what is going to be happening in the near future with the microbiome? Some really exciting things, I think, on the horizon. So there's some all sorts of really interesting drugs that are being used, some really exciting drugs that are being used in cancer, like checkpoint inhibitor therapy, which is all about trying to wake up your immune response and make it deal with tumors. But some patients didn't respond well to those. Patients who'd had antibiotics before they had checkpoint inhibitor therapy didn't cope well with the drugs. Patients who had high fiber diets did really well with the studies. Could that be something to do with your microbiome? Digoxin from Foxglove is a drug that's used to make your heart rate beat more slowly and regularly in certain conditions. In around one in 10 people, it doesn't work properly. It's linked to your microbiome. Even drugs like paracetamol don't work well in everybody because of your microbiome. Because one of the things that your microbiome does is it metabolizes your drugs. So if you're missing certain communities or certain types of bacteria, you don't metabolize the drugs properly and they can't break down into their active products. Which begs the question that perhaps we could come to a point where we could personalize medicine such that we could give you a little bacterial broth, a little just to have with you, and not, not a sit, that wasn't quite right, but never mind. <laughs> that was more like a cigarette, wasn't it? <laughs> Maybe. Um, but you could have that to try and redress the balance and get those communities in, even if it's temporarily, even if you have to keep taking it each time you have the drug. That might be the way that makes the drug work better, which is a way that we can try and cater everybody's drugs for everybody individually. And personalized therapy is an area that's really, really interesting and exciting to people. Now we come back to that experiment. You want to find out why you were touching each other. <laughs> OK, so in this room, on every surface, in the air, there's lots of bacteria. Every time we talk, every time we sneeze, every time we sing, every surface we touch, we are sharing around 37 million bacteria an hour. So when you shook each other's hands and said hi, you had a lovely little bacterial exchange. Come on, breathe that in. Breathe in everybody's microbes. So we're constantly being exposed to and acquiring new bacteria. Now, all, all of them won't necessarily live, but you know a lot of them will which asks really quest interesting questions about <laughs> sanitation. So, which is the cleanest toilet? Is it the toilet on the left or the toilet on the right? And for people who've seen the film, you know it's the dirtiest toilet in Scotland. And as a Scot, I really felt I had to include it. I think it's actually in John O'Groats, you know, I'm pretty sure I've been to that toilet. OK, so who thinks the dirtiest toilet with most faecal bacteria is on the left? Stick your hand up. Who thinks it's on the right? OK, do you want to know? <laughs> so when you clean your toilet, you essentially strip it of all bacteria. Now, remember, we're aerosolizing 37 million bacteria an hour or so when you sit down. A few skin bacteria will go on. It's a nice, clean surface they can adhere. But then, you know, you flush the toilet. That aerosolizes up a whole bunch of fecal bacteria, and they stick on too. And now you've suddenly got quite a lot of fecal bacteria on that lovely, clean surface. So therefore, this, because fecal bacteria won't survive so long in the open air, the dirty toilet might actually have the least amount of fecal bacteria in it, <laughs> may technically have more skin bacteria in it. Although I don't think very many people are going to sit on it, but you know, he's, he's having a go. 
Um, so it just, just makes you think about what really is clean and what really matters. I'm not sure I should have done that to you, because you know I'm going to be like... Ah, ah. <laughs> but this idea of the bacteria around us being really important and the bacterial exchanges is, I think, a really exciting one. So in the modern world, uh, particularly in the Western society, we're seeing an awful lot more allergies and autoimmunity. And researchers have suggested that this could be in part due to changes in our microbiome, as well as changes in the infections we get exposed to. I mean, this is called the old friends hypothesis. So changes in the microbiome within us have certainly been associated with allergies and asthma. But people have looked at the microbes we breathe in in the air and shown that you know, the microbes in rural country environments are very different to the microbes in urban environments. So could it be that these different microenvironments around us are also affecting our health? And if so, can we manipulate that? And this is where some really crazy, almost, research is starting to happen. Um, oh, this is the other source, I forgot to tell you. The other source of our wearing microbiome is our pets. Um, meet Molly, looking muddy, and Ziggy cuddling my youngest son's t um, cuddly toys there, which he then puts all over his face. It's nice. So yeah, they also are providing some microbes. So we've got the in influences from around us, the influences from our pets, the influence from each other. So can we bioengineer our buildings to make us healthy? So in the future, I mean, this is actually happening. People are investigating this. But could you have hospitals that have little microbial bombs in them that will make you bright and refreshing? Schools that are going to make you fresh and uplifting. <laughs> Who knows? Watch this space. And on that note, I thank you and your microbial communities very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.